gold flirting with 1360 again. It's pulled back a bit. Head fake or sustainable? Bitcoin, 8,400. Mr. Hodge thinks it's going to 10,000, I hear. Tankers are getting bombed or attacked or call it what you call it. But the escalation out of the Middle East is something that we want to keep an eye on. Horses are dying in Santa Anita. We talked about it last week. We touched on it. We said we'd talk about it this week, and we will. And we have a special guest this week, everybody. It's going to be Warren Stanier of ALX and Nevada Sunrise fame. We'll talk to him about his background and how he got into the crazy junior resource space. I am Gerardo Del Real with my co-host, Mr. Nick Hodge, and this is episode 23 of Bizarro World. How are you, Nick? I am just marveling in how differing different governments can uh, have different reasons why ships are exploding. It's fascinating to me. Let's get into that. Let, let, let's talk about it. Um, a little context, right? A couple of oil tankers in the Persian Gulf, um, shipping and oil tankers actually, have been hit. Some people say by missiles. Um, some people say by bombs. Some people say it's the U.S. and it's a false flag. Um, thoughts, Nick? What, what, what I think it was people? Saddam Hussein. I think it was Saddam <laughs> Hussein and the weapon of mass destruction. I think uh, the smoking gun is going to turn into a mushroom cloud, Gerardo. <laughs> How do we make money from it? <laughs> <laughs> you watch the yellow metal tick, tick, tick higher. That's it. You know, all, all jokes aside, um, I, 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 I actually, <laughs> I actually don't believe the U.S. is behind it. I don't think we are as eager to get into a traditional war with Iran as many seem to believe. You know, that's the optimist in me. The the pessimist would say that you know we the the military industrial complex is behind it, and it's it's it is what it is, right? So it's interesting stuff. Um, oil reacted to it initially. It's pulled back a bit. But, you know, geopolitically, we look around the world, stuff's getting really interesting. I don't think it's a coincidence that gold, you know, flirted with that 1360 range. It's pulled back a bit since then. And I also don't think it's a coincidence that Bitcoin is pushing 8400 right now. I said last week that gold bugs would hate me for saying that Bitcoin and gold actually could rise together and would be holding hands towards, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin and eventually $1,400 gold. I'm curious as to your thoughts. Uh, let's start with gold. Do you think it holds this time? You know, I mean, that's crystal ball stuff. It feels better than it has um, in the in the past couple of 12, 18 months. Let's call it. There's tensions uh, around the world, as you say, not just with uh, uh, the lies and the ships in the Gulf of Oman. It's, you know, it's just curious to me how it is so fast. We get Black Ops video game footage of the Iran guard putting the the sticky bomb on the side of the the oil tanker but the the japanese captain is like nah dude it was a flying object that hit us <laughs> <laughs> i was there <laughs> <laughs> anyway anyway uh it does feel really good so gold holding 13 uh 40 going to 1350 very quickly the first time it's been there in a bit and uh, really you know we've been wondering why hasn't geopolitical tensions been uh sending gold up higher the way they typically might have you know 2008 9 10 uh whatever it was a lot of people have been writing about that you know gold is so dead that it doesn't respond to geopolitics uh, anymore and and it doesn't until it does right and and this time it did and maybe that was the the catalyst that brings all the other underlying fundamentals of why gold should be going higher together right you know forget about the the geopolitics for a second that's just a flash but hopefully it's the flash that ignites the the gold bull market that we need for for uh major gold miners to replenish their reserves and for people to want to get out there and explore and actually drill again and, and basically just to kick off the bull market that the sector needs right so i'm not saying it is i'm just saying it feels better and you know hopefully this time is different right Hopefully, you know, I, I, I've said, I've, I've got on record, I sent a note to subscribers yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, saying that, you know, we, we, people that are much smarter than me and much better chartists than I am, people like Martin Armstrong, who I follow, you know, say that we need to get past that 1365 level on a weekly closing basis. Really interesting to me that we pushed up. 
I think 1357. And right when we started getting to that 1360 range, it turned around immediately. It's trading at 1340 as we speak. You know, Mr. Armstrong also believes that we need to close 1363 on a monthly closing basis in order to move higher sustainably. However, with that being said, the energy of this latest move feels different to me. And so whether right. or not we actually break through those levels, um, or, or it's a head fake and we get a pullback, which is very possible. I've always said that everybody needs to get trapped one last time to really kick, you know, everybody on the side and let really have everybody give up on gold before we get the energy back up. Regardless of which one of those plays out, um, I, I, I think it's playing out now. I, I think that's coming in the next month or two. I think we're going to get some clear direction. And I absolutely believe that we end the year um, above $1,400. So, you know, crystal ball stuff, yes, absolutely. But... That's the way I see it playing out. I'm going to have a great recession. You are going to have a wonderful recession, my friend, because as you so kindly reminded us a couple of weeks ago, you work hard and you've been very well compensated for your hard work. I feel bad for all the other people, the savers among us, right? The elderly that are saving, hoping to get a return from their bank account. Um, that don't understand how the world has changed in the past 20 or 30 years. And you know where I'm going with this. The Fed is about to cut again. You can count on that. Um, in this country, in the U.S., you can, and, and all over the world, right? But you can count on the central banks um, taking care of financial institutions and the real estate market and the stock market before they're going to take care of anybody else. So you are going to have a great recession, sir. I think Bitcoin goes to 10000 here in the next month or two. I think gold is going to go to 1400 before the year is over. And as I've said, between 1400 and 1550, there's not much there in the way of resistance. This is the big resistance. Can we close above that 1364, 1374 level on a monthly basis? So get your get get your gold names now. Buy your favorite stock, whatever that is. Subscribe to Nick's newsletters. Subscribe to mine. Subscribe to whoever you want to subscribe to. But find some good quality management. Find some good assets and go get them now because I don't think this time next year you're going to be able to buy them at today's prices. Can we talk a little bit more about some of the things you said there about who the central bank protects and, and sort of who their enemies are? You've already mentioned Martin Armstrong, and he was in the news this week um, because the government doesn't like that he likes very rare and expensive gold coins. Um, you want to wax on that a little bit? You know much more about Martin Armstrong than I do, and, and maybe touch a little bit on, you know, it just seems to me like... Um, the government and central banks don't like gold, right? Maybe I'm stating the obvious, but it's like, hey, here's this dude who's always telling people how stupid we are, and he's got a bunch of gold. Like, let's go after him for it. Do you have any? Do you have any thoughts there? And then maybe I'll tell you a story about about why Muammar Gaddafi really got killed after that. Oh, I'm dying to hear that. So I, I do have some thoughts. I followed Martin Armstrong for good gracious since he was incarcerated. Actually, this gentleman was incarcerated in the ninety in in, in the late nineties, early two thousands. Um, he ended up being incarcerated, I believe, for nearly seven years, which was the longest jailing ever for civil contempt in a federal white collar case. Let me say that again. Seven years because he wouldn't relinquish assets, which he said he no longer had, specifically millions of dollars worth of gold coins. Now, for anybody that's not familiar with Martin Armstrong, I will put up a link um, he's a self-taught economist. He's got a huge following. Um, he was arrested for what the U S said was a $700 million Ponzi scheme, um, that included hiding assets. The interesting thing about his alleged Ponzi scheme is the people that he allegedly defrauded Japanese funds whom he advised, um, came out and said, no, he actually was playing the currency spread. He wasn't defrauding anybody. It was actually the bank. Nobody got in trouble for that but Martin Armstrong, despite the fact that the people he was accused of defrauding came out and said he didn't defraud us. That didn't happen. So he made his name in the 80s and 90s. He called Russia's financial collapse. Um, he was taking full-page ads, you know, in previous gold bull and bear markets, frankly, um, saying that, look, I got this, this global database that, you know, is, is, is essentially AI before AI. Um, that takes all of the capital inflows and outflows and it takes all of these different boom and bust cycles and goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And, you know, according to him, he's got this database that spits out data. It's not him. It's it's the machine, let's call it. Right. So the government does not like him. Um, they, you know, the, the, the latest is that um, he had some coins. 
that supposedly he did not declare and somehow they ended up in an auction and all of a sudden the government you know gets get gets gets finds out that this auction is happening and that he's claiming um ownership of these coins and these assets and it's just coincidental right that the the feds immediately came in and uh and 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 filed a lawsuit so that's going on i'll put a link up to that without writing too much about martin armstrong but you know if 2008 taught me anything it taught me that if you're a financial institution um the central bank and our government has zero qualms about taking the least wealthy amongst us and making sure that the most wealthy amongst us continue to prosper i mean tim geithner Tim Geithner, um, you know, we, we can go down the list. Ben Bernanke, um, it was everybody, both the Democrats and the Republicans. Sure. They, they, they approved that, that, that spending package, right? The tax bailout, it was a tax bailout by citizens of, of the rich, of, of the richest financial institutions. Now, you can make the argument that it was necessary in order to avoid a global economic collapse. And I'll make a counter argument that says... Well, then why, if, 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 if it was so, so, so fragile at the time, why did nobody go to prison for all of the fraud that was happening? Why did the bankers issue themselves the bonuses that they issued themselves? Why weren't the people, us, the taxpayers that funded these bailouts, why, why, weren't, they, why, why weren't they rewarded with reasonable loans and reasonable interest rates um, to kind of pay back the money that the taxpayers put in, right? And that money was paid back. But once it was paid back, that the, the, the lending really stopped, except for people that are in the higher income brackets. If you've tried to buy a house lately and you make less than half a million a year, um, you've probably gone through a mountain of paperwork um, just to get a loan, right? And so, you know, that's my very short version of it. Why doesn't the government like gold? It's no one else's liability. I think it's the same reason that they don't like cryptos. They don't like Bitcoin. Um so yeah, those, that, 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 that's my short rant on that. I mean, I I, I could go further and, and you know. <laughs> sure, it's hard to, it. to it's hard to track. It's hard to tax. It helps people uh, avoid their their system of of money creation and the stranglehold they have on that, in which they control the uh, the amount that's printed and distributed and and like to track all that so they can. Uh, collect their taxes, etc. Of course, they don't like when 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 people try to and governments. Let's talk about that in a second. Go outside the the system of the the dollar that was you know so beautifully created in the in the early 1900s, um, and that has that has served well to enrich um, those on the inside. Let's call it for the for the past century. And you know, I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes, but when I was reading the Martin Armstrong piece that was in Bloomberg today, I think it was, I couldn't help but think about um, a story I was told by a gentleman that you and I both know. We won't mention his name, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll, t I'll, 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 I'll relate the story, and I'm going to mess up some of the details, so excuse me. But it, it goes something like this, and this has to do with when uh, NATO forces went in and, uh, you know, they basically went in and killed Mo Mo Muammar Gaddafi, the leader of Libya, uh, some years ago. And, and destabilized that entire region, by the way, which is... And destabilized the entire region, yes. Yes, for sure, which is what many people think, you know, led to the kickoff of the Arab Spring, etc. And the whole, like you said, the destabilization of the region. And, you know, what was the, the story in the West? Well, he's so bad to his people, we got to liberate them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The same story that it always is. But... Uh, in some emails that came out specifically that were tied to Hillary uh, Clinton and just through, you know, research and other information that's out there, it came to surface, it came to light that Gaddafi was trying to create a gold-backed currency to run an end around the dollar for trading oil, basically. Um, so similar to things that China and Russia are doing to, to avoid the dollar, which is one of the underlying causes of the trade war with China, right? Um, and so we went in and killed Muammar Gaddafi so he wouldn't set up this gold back currency. But here's the story and how it ties back to, to Martin Armstrong and why the world's most elite and the world's richest, the most powerful folks, um, uh, well, they like gold in one respect, but they hate gold if it threatens what's theirs, like we just talked about. And so... This is just a story, an anecdotal story that, you know, highlights how deep and entrenched gold is in the financial system and how important it really is. And and so when you hear people like Warren Buffett just call it things like a pet rock or something, just how stupid that makes Warren look because of how serious gold actually is. So here's the story. Um, 
this guy that we know is um, an international, let's call him coin expert dealer and dealer and expert in antiques and, and let's various call them the coin expert dealer, collectible antiques, coin expert dealers, <laughs> antique collectibles guy that everyone goes to. Right. Let's call him that guy. That's that's right. And so the story is this. He gets let's call it a cryptic message that says, hey, I need you to come to to my mansion. I'm, I'm going to make this short and skip some stuff. I need you to come to my mansion in, in California and, and check something out because I, I know who you are and I know that you, you're going to know something about this. Um, and so, again, I'm going to butcher the story, but I think they send a, a car for this gentleman who is who is packing heat, as he always does. And he goes to the front gate and um, some questions are asked. He's He goes inside, he's frisked, they take his firearm. And this is sort of like the way this story was, was relayed to me. This is like Scarface stuff, right? I mean, he's in like Al Pacino's like You're whatever. You're describing my teens, Nick. <laughs> no, I right. didn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Miami, Miami, whatever palace. That's like the king of the drug trade. Anyway, the, right. you know he's got like girls there, guys with guys with guns. Clearly protection. Clearly it's serious. And so he wants to show this person um, this coin that he has and, and get his opinion on it and, and see if there's any way that you know they can do some business or there's anything that can come of, of this coin. And do you know what the coin is? As it was told to me, the coin was one of a few of the original coins that Muammar Gaddafi. Um, had struck when he was trying to get this gold back currency off the ground. And so this was some Middle Eastern gentleman who had somehow come into control of one of these coins. And it's clearly highly valuable. It's clearly a piece of monetary history. It's clearly a piece of, of world history. And and to my knowledge, the, the gentleman that we know declined to be involved in this and, and politely thank the people for showing it to him. But decided to be on his way and and he was given a, a really nice gift told not to he was given a box told not to open it until the the car was was out of sight from the the house that he went in and I, that might have not been as interesting as I built it up to be but when I think about stuff like that real people who have been in in real experiences like that and just how deep the 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 love of gold goes in, I guess, the world. How long humans have been involved with gold? Thousands of years, and and just how important it is in the global financial system um, when the when the mainstream tries to poo poo it. So sorry if I butchered the story, but when I heard that story the first time, I was just like, wow. No, no, that 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 was great, and I think um, you know it highlights several points, obviously. But yeah, you. you, you you think those people love gold now? Wait, wait until the bond market collapses, and that, I'm telling you, that's coming. I don't know if it's this year. I don't know if it's next year. I don't know if it's five years from now. I'm usually early on everything, um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna learn. Everybody is going to learn. You know, 20 year old traders that you know are sitting in New York on Wall Street right now that have no idea what a financial collapse looks like. Um, it's going to get really interesting. It's going to get interesting. Um, you know, another thing that's interesting, our guest today, Warren Stanier, is interesting. He's got a heck of a background. I say we give him a ring, if you don't mind, Nick. Is that all right? Let's get him on the line. He has the honor of being our first guest. It took us 23 episodes to uh, exhaust our breath and want to have somebody else talk. So, um yeah, Warren Stanier, he's from Nevada Sunrise and ALX, and he's got, as Gerardo told me before we started recording, quite a history in the mining space, and so we're going to let him tell some stories. All right, let's give him a ring here. He's also one of the few people not afraid to come on here, <laughs> so we'll just leave it, we'll just leave it there. Um, here we go. <laughs> Warren, are you there? I am, Gerardo. Warren, good day. A good day to you, sir. We have Nick, we have Warren, and we have myself. We were joking just before uh, we got you on air here that you were the first soul brave enough to come on the podcast <laughs> and uh, not shy away from the language and some of the views that we tend to have around here. Oh, my God. Is this live? This is live, sir. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. I always want. Is there a seven-second delay in case I... Let a curse word slip. Oh no! Curse your ass off. This is this is that podcast. You 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 can let <laughs> it fly, Warren. I probably won't. I only swear in front of my wife and daughter. So you know, <laughs> generally. So listen, when you we, we were talking to Muammar Gaddafi, and you 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 mentioned that he had some pretty big ideas, and I want to get into that. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about your background. You and I had a conversation last week, and and it's kind of what inspired the invitation to the podcast. You have a pretty fascinating background 
on your family's history in the mining space and how you got involved in the space. And I'd love for you to share some of that because I thought it was pretty neat. Well, thanks, Gerardo. I, I grew up in a, a, you know, what do they call it? Ticky-tacky suburban box home, you know, like where they're ticky-tacky all the same. But Little my boxes. grandparents, what's that? Little boxes. <laughs> Little boxes they all, with different variations on where the garage door was. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But my grandfathers were both gold prospectors. Um, my mother's father was in the Klondike, went there in 1906. So after the main rush, and a lot of people had left, but there was mining going on. There was The dredges were starting to come in. I'm not sure exactly what year, but uh, bigger companies were buying up ground. So he had a claim that he worked with another fellow, and they sold it to a big company and uh, made some money. Came back to Prince Edward Island, bought a racetrack, lost it all. Huh. <laughs> so, yeah, the highs and the lows. So that was um, like a perfect introduction to the junior resource space. <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Risk and reward. There you go. And then what? Ha- and then what happens, Warren? Well, um, he ended up raising a family of ten children. So I guess you know he had some spare time. <laughs> <laughs> So fast forward a little bit. What what piqued your interest? What the heck were you doing when you decided, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and get rich with uranium? And we'll talk about some of that success here in just a second because you've been serial serially successful in the uranium space. Obviously, um, as CEO of Nevada Sunrise Gold Company, I'm biased. Uh, I'm I'm a shareholder. I'm biased. I have been a supporter for a long time. I've made a lot of good money with Nevada Sunrise. I've lost a little. I'm bit. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> but how, what 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 inspired you to get into the mining business? Well, I guess it was that background of, of seeing my, my father's father had gold down in the basement and mercury, which was kind of fun to play with. You're not supposed to, but, you know, because you <laughs> use mercury to get the gold out of the black sand that you've, when you've been panning in British Columbia. So I, I knew what it looked like. Um, I also, at one time, I, I listen, would hear the radio every day driving into school with my father and into Vancouver and I, I heard Afton Mines go from $0.10 cents to $5 mm. in 1971, 72. So that, what would be the equivalent of that today? That would be like from $0.50 cents to 20 bucks or something, you know. That'll motivate you to go see if you can do something. Well, and plus my father's friend was a director of Afton Mines, and he used to come and give me $20 bills to look after his dog, so I knew he had money, you know. <laughs> He did okay. So when you see that in British Columbia, we were founded as a boom town. We were founded on mining. Forestry and fishing, they came after that. Okay, we need to build a, a cabin. Okay, let's cut a tree down. Oh, we need some food. Okay, let's, you know, fish in the creek. But it was for gold that people came here. And then we found a lot more. So it's always been part of the fabric of my life. People that we knew that were miners people that were prospectors. Um, so uh, I was working in the advertising business and doing a lot of commercials and things like that, jingles, writing music and, and singing on things. And I met this fellow that was the president of Pioneer Metals, which was a TSX-listed company. Huh. And I thought, wow, this guy, I wouldn't mind working for him. And it's funny, when you, when you make a goal for yourself, sometimes they're almost subconscious. You don't realize where you're actually heading it's almost like you're like a a needle you know a, a magnet being drawn to the north pole <laughs> you know what i mean that's what well so i i ended up working for him and uh within a few years he kept giving me raises and options and made me vice president of this and that and and so yeah i really i i read a lot i got to meet some of the best geologists and geophysicists in the trade learned from them so here i am Let's talk about your big score, and I know the history, but I, I, I'd love for you to share it. Um, you, we've had conversations about your uranium success, and, and for those not familiar with Warren, Warren dabbles um, in, in multiple commodities, gold, silver, lithium, um, cobalt, <laughs> uranium, but you had huge success in the uranium space um, in, in, in a bull market, not unlike the one that I think both Nick and I see coming um, down the pipeline. So can you share that a little bit, kind of where you were um, and, and, and how the heck you went from having a little to having a little bit more? 
Well, yes. So I was working with Pioneer Metals. Um, we put an ad in the Northern Miner because we had $6 million. They had done a tax losses deal where they sold tax losses and got cash in the door. And um, it, it was money sitting there. What do we do with it? So we were looking for properties and put the ad in the Northern Miner. And this gentleman called from Saskatchewan. He was living in Alberta, but he had worked in Saskatchewan. And he said, there's nickel deposits in Saskatchewan, and they could go under the sandstone. So we thought, well, BHP's looking for nickel. This is 1996. Right. So we staked some ground, and we did some UTEM, which is a deep penetrating uh, ground EM system out of Canada. And we didn't find nickel uh, in, in terms of the way the conductors looked, but the contractor said, you know, this this looks more like a uranium play. So that led to the creation of UEX Corporation, which we called UX, simply because it's U X E X Exploration. <laughs> kind of like U R Energy. Like, <laughs> which yeah, Nick and I always he always reminds me yeah. of the correct pronunciation. I said, I don't care, Nick. I'm going to call it U R Energy. U <laughs> R Energy. Yeah. Well, anyway, people call it UEX, and that's the symbol. But so we started the company in 2002. It was a push out, so you got one share of UEX for every share of Pioneer Metals that you had. Hmm. The president, for example, had 10 million shares of Pioneer Metals, so he got 10 million shares of UX for free. This is 2002. Well, everybody thought we were nuts. Chemical was our partner, which was a good thing. I mean, they had 20% of the stock. We had properties on their side of the basin that we were going to explore. Uh, we ended up doing a deal with what's now Orano. At the time, it was Arriva for Shea Creek in 2004 and that got some attention because suddenly there was a, a supply squeeze for uranium fuel and all of a sudden the price of uranium started to rise in late November uh, 2003. Hmm. Wow, so suddenly we're 25 cents again instead of eight and then all of a sudden we're 50 cents when we do the Arriva deal in 2004 for Shea Creek and then in 2005 we hit I think it was eight and a half 8.8 meters of 27 percent mm. uranium at Shea Creek, and everything just went wild. In the middle it, of a bull ended, market, you hit this. Yeah, it was it was July of 2005, and it was just really getting going at that point, and people were starting to realize, hey, we can buy and sell uranium. Lehman Brothers and this guy down in Portland, I can't remember his name. He was he was buying and selling physical uranium, and so the price was just starting to go crazy and. And then Cigar Lake flooded in 2006, and that really got people excited because Shea Creek didn't have water. There was no water problem. So we ended up by the sum, let's see, summer of 2006, we were $5. So my employer had 10 million shares that he had been given. <laughs> you can imagine how he felt. At but as he, said to, <laughs> as he said to me years before, he said, Warren, it's kind of like golf. I'm the pro, and you're the caddy. So if I win, you get 10%. I said, okay, well, that's not bad. You know? And it did kind of work out like that. I love it. I love it. So I won't do the math, and I love how you told us how many shares he had. You didn't tell us how many you had, Warren, but I, I, I know you did well because you've been in the business ever since. Well, you know, I put a lot of money back in, too, like we all have, but hey, it, it provided uh, something for my family that we didn't have before. And, and we were right on top of the uranium curve because we had started early. We started, we announced our first uranium uh, venture in 1997 and nobody wanted to do anything with us except Cameco. But by 2007, the stock was at $7. I mean, at one point we had a billion and a half market cap. Wow. So it was around that time I... I just decided that I wanted to move on. I'd been with Steve Sorensen for 12 years. I learned a lot from him. Uh, and I, I just wanted to do my own thing. And, and there was a lot of pressure. You know, we were, we were under the eye of, of the microscope, so to speak, in a number of different ways in terms of who we were, what we were doing. And, and we were a pretty small company, really, for people. So let's fast so, forward now, right? 2019, you are... Mm -hmm the head of two small companies here we are with gold you know which it's pretty much been almost a 10-year bear market with a little blip in 2016 that got everybody excited only to get kicked on the side again 
um, uranium has had, you know, a, a similar course. And, you know, I think, I think if I ask Nick, he would probably, and, and I'll ask him, um, Nick, what do you see for gold and uranium? Do you think we're higher next year or lower than we are today? I think, you know, we kind of have to be higher, especially if the, the gold rally that we're seeing this week is the real deal, as we talked about earlier in it. And it feels like it is. There's a there's a bit more of excitement around it. Uranium, I'm, a, I'm actually a bit more confident in because it's it's almost undeniable. It's a supply and demand thing. Right. I mean, we know that gold majors have to replenish their reserves. And, and that's one thing. But without uranium, I mean, one in five lights in the United States goes off and we're nearing a place now where we're at a uh, or approaching a precarious supply imbalance. Um, and we're certainly there in the United States with some 95% of the you know, uranium we put in our 99 or 100 reactors coming from foreign, foreign countries, some of which uh, don't like us too much. And then you, know, you add in all the stuff that, that everybody uh, in the uranium space talks about, right? China and India coming online, the, the creation of the new funds lately, yellow cake, um, the, the the ending of the the DOE selling surplus supplies into the market further exacerbating the supply scenario and so all those fundamental drivers seem like uranium has to be higher and that's what I was going to ask Warren actually he talked he mentioned the flooding of Cigar Lake uh, which was a huge catalyst for the the last run in in U308 and here we are approaching. Uh, a section 232 decision in the United States which, which I'm viewing as a as a potential catalyst to, to get this uranium bull kick started well Warren what are your what are your thoughts there what's going to take to, to kick it off well you're both Americans so it, it would benefit you as Americans more if if the decision the 232 says that you know US uranium production has to has to rise that it has to be a certain amount me being Canadian and, and our properties in Canada, I mean, we'd like to be treated like your friends still, like we always have been. And as you see, the steel and aluminum tariffs were lifted on Canadian exports recently. So there was a little bit of posturing from the U.S. government for a while on, on that. And, and then I'm not saying cooler has prevailed. It's all about negotiation. But Canada has supplied a huge amount of uranium to the United States in the past, and I hope that that's going to continue without any kind of prohibitive tariff on it. I, I'm fully in favor of having that on all these other countries that are corrupt and run by dictators and, and, and committees. And, and they're the ones that have flooded the market. So, yeah, let, let's slap not, something but, on. But not you with that friendly Trudeau gentleman and, and you, <laughs> you polite ca Canadians. But I tell you, you keep winning NBA championships and we're not going to like you too much. I didn't, I didn't want to bring that up. But look, <laughs> it, it's just like the NHL. You, you, the, the Boston Bruins, probably two-thirds of the, or half the guys are Canadian. And, and half the Raptors, if not three-quarters, if not all of them are American. So we are a blended North American society here. We do have... But we do have Justin Trudeau, but he won't be around for much longer, I hope. So let's talk he, the changing. Oh, go ahead, Nick. And, and then I want to ask uh, Warren on his thoughts about politics in Canada and, and, and where specifically where he's at. But but go ahead, Nick. No, I was I was just going to I was just going to make a joke. It wasn't important. Let's talk to Warren. <laughs> so it makes a joke. I, I no, love no, jokes. No. <laughs> OK. All right. It, obviously, it was about me. Uh, you were going to be laughing at me, not with me. OK. Um, so, well, being Canadian, it, it's, it's frustrating um, when I see how our society uh, has sort of wildly embraced the left, wildly embraced uh, this lack of exploitation of the resources that could make our country wealthy. And the, the irony is it would then provide all the things that the left wants, like better health care, free education, all the things Bernie Sanders wants. Canada is only 30 million people. We, we could exploit our resources, our oil and gas, especially the natural gas, to a, a very high degree and provide a better standard of living. But instead, the people that are walking around with signs here and blocking the pipelines, they, don't, they want all that other stuff, health care and education, for free. But we, how are we supposed to pay for it? And we, we know we nothing need to, is free, right? Free we need somebody to else's, yeah. We need these pipelines, but here's the thing, and, and again, I love Americans, and they're very shrewd, 
and they drive hard bargains. It's my belief and that of other Canadians that Nick, the Texans. Nick, I think, I think he just called us assholes. No, <laughs> no, I think I, hey, it's a game. It's a it's game theory, right? This is what we're in. It's Survivor. It's the game of Survivor, and people get voted off the island. Well, we're the ones that are not able to export our resources, but Texas does. Absolutely. Texas sends nat- liquid natural gas through the Panama Canal to Asia. They don't want British Columbia to ship natural gas. Mm. So who are they going to support? They will support Tides Canada, and they will support Greenpeace, and they will support anybody here in Canada that will wave a sign. Even the natives want these now, the First Nations they want these pipelines, a lot of them, because they know what it will bring for their people. Wealth, comfort, but instead <laughs> we're being strangled. So, so do you and think that some of that is self-imposed? People, pardon me? Do you think some of that is self-imposed, Warren? Well, self, yes. I mean, sure, Canadian, people get swept up. They get propagandized. Right. I don't want to get into global warming right now, but, you know. <laughs> Climate change. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, but the I, fact I like is it, Warren. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't get to hear you riled up too often. We're usually talking <laughs> Nevada Sunrise Gold or, or, or you know, ALX, and so it, it's, it's good to hear these takes. But continue. This is fascinating stuff. Well, I, I, I'm pretty much at the end. I mean, we want these things. We want to improve our country. I think it's and people like Trudeau, they're sort of caught because they have to cater to the left. At the same time, uh, there's big money, and, and that's not, they're not making enough money. And so, you know, you have to keep everybody happy. Free health care, okay, and, and lots of it, and free education, that's one thing. But people that are investing, they want to see a return on their investment too, on billions of dollars that they put into uh, pipelines and factories and this and that. So... Uh, I, I hope we can turn it around with a new government, and I hope that people can see the light and look at Norway as an example where they have a trillion dollars U.S. in a national a sovereign wealth fund, and that's from natural gas and some oil sales. I don't know the split, but it's mainly gas, I think. Hmm. Small country, lots of money, everything they need. Let we should be able to do that. Absolutely. Let me ask you this, Warren, a Canadian's take. What does it look like when you come to the U.S. and you read the headlines about the gun violence in this country or the, the, the state of our health care in this country? Um, what does that look like from your perspective, being that you get to uh, live and experience a, a, a different system? What does it look like to you from your Canadian point of view when you come out here and see the crazy shit that happens? Well, gun violence is a problem here, too. Mm. It's just not as big. Mm. And, you you know, the more people you have, the more unbalanced people you're going to have walking the streets. It's just a, a, a mathematical fact. So you allow that person access to a gun, especially to an automatic weapon. I don't, I don't believe that people should be allowed to have military-style rifles. I can see automatic hunting. weapons have been illegal in the United States since 1986. War, no one has automated automatic weapons. They're semi. Right, but you have that bump stock thing. The guy in Las Vegas didn't he use something semi-automatic or, you know, I, I don't know a lot about your gun laws. I have to say, but you just have more guns than we do, and we we started some pretty strict stuff. Like my father had a 357 Magnum that he used to take out in the bush because if if you meet a grizzly bear, you know. That's your only friend at that point, and you got to stick it right in his mouth, <laughs> you know. So when he died, when my father died. It was in the gun safe, and it turned out to be not registered. Oh my goodness, there was a big problem that my mother had, and eventually she had to turn it into the RCMP. And you know, because every handgun is is registered, every rifle that is now registered, as far as I know. So I think you need a, a better system. I think it should be tougher. To get guns, I don't know that you'll ever get rid of somebody pulling out a weapon and blazing away in some public place. It it happens in the rest of the world too. It's not just an American phenomenon. So you're not anti-gun. You just think there's a smarter way to approach gun ownership. Is what kind of what it sounds like. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's kind of. I'm not anti-gun. Not at all. Um, as oddly enough, my wife 
had her firearms acquisition certificate in her in her life before you know we got married and she every time we watch a show on TV I say what kind of gun is that she says oh that's a that's a Glock <laughs> and she knows every gun <laughs> good but, stuff uh, no good not stuff. against them. So listen, Warren, obviously you took the time today. We're, we're, we're thankful that you came on. Um, I absolutely want to give you the opportunity to talk about um, ALX and Nevada Sunrise Gold. I've called you the hardest working CEO for a company with a $3 million market cap. And I'm, I'm speaking specifically about Nevada Sunrise Gold. Um, what keeps you going? You've been, you, you've been very active. You actually just announced a deal for ALX um, on some cobalt properties, I believe, in Saskatchewan. So what... What keeps you ticking? How do you take this bear market and keep rolling in assets that sooner or later you're going to find a discovery, right? You're going to you're, you're going to hit something and and you've you've played this beautifully. You just haven't gotten to the part where it's a bull market and 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 there's, you know, there's discoveries being made, but I I I have faith that that's coming. That's why I'm a shareholder. What keeps you going and how do you use bear markets to your advantage? Well, first of all, I thank you for having faith and I, I look at the other Warren, Warren Buffett, who would say, buy stocks when nobody wants them. And it's kind of like that with mineral properties. Like we just staked the Axis Lake deposit in northern Saskatchewan because Pure Nickel, the other company, gave up, I guess. They let the claims lapse. So we had to do a very, uh, a very uh, well-coordinated staking program with a few people and we managed to it was a huge rush it was over in 10 minutes and us and two other companies basically got all the ground and and we got the the meat of the axis lake nickel deposit hmm. has some cobalt in it it's nickel copper so why did we do that because there was an opportunity it's only been the surface has just been scratched on that thing for example there's airborne data that can see down a thousand meters that's never been processed in the modern era. I contacted the people that flew it last week or early this week, and I said, hey, uh, we'd like to reprocess that and do modeling on it and see what we can see. And the guy was so excited. It's like, yeah, he said, none of those processing techniques were, were available in 2008 when we flew it. So now we can see where maybe this deposit, which appears sub-economic now, 0.6% nickel, 0.6% copper, three and a half million tons. Maybe there's a lot more going on that nobody saw. They didn't know where to look. Why so is it that you've been able, Warren, and sorry to cut you off, but this is a quick question before I forget it. Why is it that you've been able to continue? Why, why do you continue to find assets that are highly prospective for discoveries? You've done this brilliantly with Nevada Sunrise, and, and yet there's so many CEOs that have two properties um, and just sit on their hands waiting for a bull market to come. What's the difference between you and them? What keeps you going? How do you keep your well, finger on the pulse to know that, you know, this, these claims lapsed and you, like you said, the stake, the staking, the rush lasted 10 minutes, but you were able to get in there in those 10 minutes, right? Yeah, because we had uh, one person in our group who, who figured something out that would give us an edge. And one of the claims, we beat the other team by seven seconds. They actually overlapped right on the meat of the deposit. And uh, seven seconds, you know, that's pretty close, but we, we won that one. Um, so, so why is it? Um, I, I mean, I've always looked for value in things. When I was a kid, we didn't have a lot of money. You look for, you know, pop bottles and cans and take them in and get some money. I mean, Absolutely. stuff that other people threw away. Uh, I think a lot of times people give up people die, properties become available. It's like the Lovelock Cobalt Mine in, in Nevada Sunrise. Somebody had those claims since 1995, but in 2017, they didn't renew them for an unknown reason. I think somebody died. And then the other people around him, they don't know what was in his head or what his deadlines were. When September 1st rolled around, they didn't know any better. So all of a sudden, these eight claims came open and so those are the kinds of things that, that I like to acquire that it's just hidden value or things that sat on a shelf for a long time. And now we have new techniques. We have new forms of modeling and, and the, what the computers can do. It can show us things that people just couldn't see 10 years ago even. 
So let's talk a little bit about each company briefly. Uh, you mentioned your success earlier when you took, you know, eight and nine, 10 cent shares. And eventually those became, you know, six, seven, eight dollar shares. That obviously requires a bull market. Both Nick and I see a bull market in gold and uranium developing. Um, you have a variety of assets. I mentioned copper, cobalt, lithium, gold, uranium. Can you give me a quick, uh, and, and, and you were in the entertainment business for a little bit, Warren. So can you <laughs> give me the quick elevator pitch for each of those ALX and Nevada sunrise? Well, for ALX, we just re received this new property from Orano, formerly Arriva, the French, huge French nuclear company. Uh, this could be a, uh, just a total game changer for ALX. We're partway between the Cigar Lake mine and the uh, MacArthur River mine, the two richest uranium mines in the world. That's where you want to be. Nobody knew about this property. It was sitting on a shelf, basically, and, and tapped away at just to keep it in good standing for the last... It's a 40-year joint venture. Mm. So they never actually went at it the way, say, Fission Uranium did at Patterson Lake, where you drill 30,000 meters in a year. They just didn't do it. They didn't have the budgets. And maybe some of these big companies at times, they, they kind of go slow. Like, do you think Chemical wants to find uranium right now? <laughs> right, right. So anyway. what's the approach moving forward for ALX? It's, you have a market cap. Where is it now? I think shares are trading at five and a half cents. Yeah, five and a half cents. So we're, we're six, uh, I guess, six to seven million dollars. I haven't run the math on it today, but um, with this financing, we're up to 112 million shares. So, um, and for those not familiar, how much cash do you have in the treasury? Uh, there's well over $2 million cash. So a third is backed got up a, by cash, a third of that market cap. Yeah, we have uh, 1.4 million shares of Denison still in the treasury from when we sold them 80% of Hook Carter back in 2016. So that's worth about a million dollars right now. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Yeah, we, we've been lucky, you know, in this bad market. Things have and we had some believers in Toronto that, that helped us with this past finance and put a million and a half dollars into the company. I mean, that was huge. What's the plan for that, that, for, that, for that money and the project that you just acquired? How do you move that forward and unlock some value there for shareholders? Well, this is where the luck part comes in because we're going to drill holes and we're going to drill them with the best information that we have. And if, if we hit something, then it's game on. And it'll be like, the way UX was or the way Alpha Minerals was when we found Patterson Lake with fission uranium, you know, all of a sudden things will change and it changes fast. Excellent. Like next gen, next gen going from three, uh, 30 cents to four bucks, you know, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that can happen. So that's what I, what I dream about. I have still have dreams. <laughs> I can still dream. And we found some some money, and and we have to spend 1.25 million in the next year at Close Lake, so we've got that in the bank, and I can't wait to get out there. And Arano's going to operate, and we'll drill some holes. Fantastic ticker symbol, obviously. A <laughs> A L Alpha <laughs> Lima there you on go. venture. There you go. Yeah. Now sell me on Nevada Sunrise, although you don't have to, because I, as I mentioned, I'm a bias shareholder, long term <laughs> supporter. Of oh, I want to sell you on this company. Don't uh, you worry. <laughs> have at it. Have at it. Fire away. Well, why should I care well, about for... Nevada Sunrise? Why do I keep writing checks, including the one that I'm about to write again? Right. I believe right. Nick wrote a well, check recently. Nick, is that correct? I wrote a check. Yeah, yes, go. he did. We got it. We got that check. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> look, uh -huh. Nevada is is one of the best places in the world to look for minerals. And to me, I'm, I'm just amazed by what it has. Look, look at what people have been finding there. First, it was, well, obviously gold and silver. Uh, then the lithium mine started 50 years ago at Silver Peak. Uh, now there's vanadium deposits that people are exploiting and drilling off and, and coming up with estimates for. And then I find out there's cobalt. So that was when we went into cobalt in, in 2017, and we've since... Uh, marketed that to Global Energy Metals Corp, a venture-listed company. Um, they're really excited about it. They consider it to be their flagship property right now, as far as I can see, because in Nevada, because in Europe, people love the, the lure of, of the West. <laughs> um, there's money coming in from Europe for that. So when I look at all those things put together, the infrastructure, you can drive almost anywhere, um, most time, you know, there's only a couple of months of the year where 
there might be snow in the mountains and it's tough to get around, but most of the year you can work. The permitting is very, very sensible. And I, I would never say permitting is easy, but uh, it's very sensible and it goes quickly in Nevada. So we've got a lot going on there. We still have the Kinsley Mountain Project. We've got a chunk of it, 21%. Liberty Gold is the operator. They're planning some drilling for later in the year, so we're waiting for them to uh, to show us the, the exact plan. We have a general idea right now. We want to drill Coronado, which is our VMS project. We're near the Big Mike mine, which was mined out almost 50 years ago, uh, a very high-grade core of copper mineralization with cobalt and gold. And so we've got an area beside it, or two miles away, two and a half miles away, that that shows uh, a geophysical anomaly that looks like it could be a VMS deposit. So we need the money to go drill that. It's just a tough market right now, and uh, but we hope to be doing that this year. So multiple drilling campaigns. You have 20, what, is it 21% of Kinsley Mountain, if I recall correctly? 20, 21%, yes. 21%. You own Coronado. You have the right to earn into, I believe, 100% of that project, correct? That's right. That's right. And, and We'd those, like to keep 100%, 100% if we can. Excellent. Yeah. And for those not familiar, can you can you explain the grades of the Big Mike mine, which was the initial first deposit? For those not familiar with BMS deposits, they tend to happen in clusters, which is the theory here. And so you actually believe that Big Mike uh, was a smaller deposit among many. And obviously you're looking for the prize, right, which is the bigger the bigger deposit there. Talk to us about the historic grades there, because they're pretty uh, pretty compelling. They are. Um, so it's it's ironic. I, I started looking at Big Mike uh, papers from the past and drill logs and reports, and I see this name, Larry Lahusen. Well, Larry Lahusen is the president of Uracan Resources, a uranium company in Canada. But in 1969, he just graduated from the University of New Mexico. And so they put him to work mapping as they started mining and digging out the pit at Big Mike. So Big Mike had about 200 feet of dirt sitting on top of it. And out of this dirt was this little Gossen, an outcrop that was rusty. People sampled it. It had a couple of grams of gold. Nobody knew what it meant, where to go, what to do. Somebody had the vision to start drilling, and they hit a high-grade core so about of copper, Grades were in excess of 11% copper. Uh, they they got about 20 million, 25 million pounds out of, of copper out of Big Mike, so it wasn't a huge deposit. But they were shipping ore, putting it into a train, taking it to a boat, and it was going to Japan, it was going to Germany in the rock. There was no processing. So what we hope is to find something like Big Mike, but bigger, and when I talked to Larry and told him what we were doing, he says, well, he says, that's a very good possibility, Warren. They just might be a little bit deeper, but they could be there. So when we flew VTEM, the helicopter-borne EM system that nobody had ever used in that area, we immediately saw anomalies in a line fr- trending away from Big Mike, trending to the north, to the northwest. And that's Coronado. So... We believe there could be something there because general geological thought is that these things appear in clusters. Uh, they're, they're, they're completely buried, so you can't see anything on surface. And this is what Hud Bay was doing for many, many years around Flin Flon, just finding them one after the other, buried. You couldn't see anything. Fascinating. You Fascinating. Think, yeah. What's the, what's the market cap on Nevada Sunrise right now? I think it's a whopping two point oh. two million Canadian. <laughs> uh, that would be about it. Yeah, forty eight times four and a half. Let's say five. Let's round up. There we go. There we go. And, and so lastly, I want you to touch on the water rights really quick, which I believe are, you know, more valuable than the market cap. Let it. You know, let's put Coronado to the side. Let's put Kinsley Mountain to the side. Let's talk the water rights briefly. Can you talk about that? It's kind of hard to mine for lithium if you don't have any water, right? It's hard to mine for anything in Nevada if you don't have water. There's lots of people with projects that they talk about their projects, but they don't have any water lined up. They don't know where they're going to get it. So I don't know how they'll ever make a mine. Uh, The people that really are dedicated and going to make mines are the ones that, that lock up the water rights early. So which is what we tried to do with lithium in the Clayton Valley. I mean, we, we did it. We bought a water right. So who do we have 
stampeding down our front door is Albemarle Corporation. At the at the time, their market cap was about, I think, about five billion U.S. Um, they're the world's largest lithium producer, I believe, um, since they bought Rockwood Lithium in 2015. They didn't want us to be able to use the right, so we've been in litigation for three years here, and we're we're coming towards the end now. We're at a stage where we can go to a hearing and prove that our water right should not have been forfeited by the state which is what Albemarle demanded and received from the state of Nevada. Uh, we believe there was water use there. We've got records to prove it. So if we go to a hearing, we believe that we can prove that the water rights should not have been forfeited. At that point, it'll have a lot more value than it does now. Uh, a water right sold in Yarrington earlier this year for about $3,000 an acre foot. So it was $6 million that came into Quaterra Resources mm. from a sale of part of their very large water right. So in our case, 3,000 times 1770, that's well over 5 million U.S. And again, you sit uh, here we, with a market cap of about $2 million Canadian. And we would have to split whatever proceeds, if we ever sold the right in the future, the first step is to get it back Right now, it's in good standing while it awaits a hearing. But if for some reason we're forfeited, well, that's, that's a, a not a very savory route. But if it comes back, like so many of these water rights have been restored in the last two years to people that were forfeited like us very, very capriciously by the state of Nevada, and, and these have been reversed. So we're looking forward to a reversal and, and then finding a partner that needs our water. And we'll know and soon. If that happens, is, correct, Warren? Yeah. Pardon me. We'll know soon how what what that outcome is going to be. I, I always think it'll be soon. It, it sometimes soon. It could be soon. <laughs> a little longer soon than than you want it to be. <laughs> but, Fantastic, but well, it's, Warren. It's been super interesting. Um, I I I hope that you enjoyed coming on, and and we absolutely enjoyed having you and getting your take um you know on a multitude of things so thank you so much for your time today we really 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 appreciate it well, well i i do too it's it's like many of the conversations we have and it's just i i guess i i don't know what the effect will be it's going out into the into the wild internet but i, I really appreciate the opportunity to to be heard and thank you nick and, and thank you gerardo thanks warren it's good having you we'll chat later next week warren okay terrific all thanks. right bye bye guys all right bye Well, that was neat. Our first guest came and went. We got to talk gun control and a little bit of health care in Canada and the U.S. And, and, and I think he nicely called us assholes. <laughs> true, true, true. We're shrewd. <laughs> no, that's Warren Stanier, everybody. I encourage everybody to go take a look at ALX Uranium um, and, and Nevada Sunrise. He, he is one of the hardest working CEOs, despite the fact that his companies have a combined market cap of i think about six million dollars so um solid solid group of people solid properties multiple drill campaigns this year shots on goal um, alx and nevada sunrise gold can we talk about the horses really quick nick i know it's uh, i want to i want to wish you a fa happy father's day by the time people listen to this it would have came and went as we record on friday and publish on monday so i hope everyone had a great father's day happy father's day to you nick and to you as well gerardo thank you i appreciated 29 horses have now died at the santa anita park um the governor of california is saying enough is enough um, 29 horses have died. When I first saw this headline a few weeks ago, it was 27, I believe. And I thought this was like in the history of the track. No, since December. Yeah, this is since December. This is fucking insane to me. I mean, you know, they, they, I was reading this article on time and I'll put a link up and they say that the variables thought to contribute to the deaths are the use of whips, drugs, and medications and the general track conditions. Um, what in the fuck is going on at Santa Anita that is not going on anywhere else? I mean, this seems criminal to me. 
That's all. I, I, That's my rant. Yeah, I no, guess. I don't have an answer. I've been following along with you, and I think when I first started looking, the number was in like the high teens, and then it was 22, 25, 26. Last week was 27. You just said 29. I hadn't seen the 29 number. I was talking about it a bit with my mother-in-law, who fancies herself a horse person, and uh, she cited the conditions of the track. You would think that, um, you know, when you see two dozen horses die in – um, a couple of months, you think there's some sort of disease outbreak or some sort of contagious illness uh, going around. But no, in fact, these are horses that are being, you know, injured during training or during races that, that then have to be euthanized. And that happens all the time, unfortunately, um, in horse racing. It's a brutal sport. The horses are trained and bred and exercised and drugged to be beasts on the track um and so they're high strung and uh they're easily uh injured we have seen in, in past famous races like the triple crown i'm thinking of for example when a horse uh, goes down and has to be euthanized right there on the track but 29 since uh december 26th i think is the date that the media is using is obviously an exorbitant amount of dead horses and i have really no opinion on the horse racing industry or the dog racing industry um, for that matter. But clearly this is an anomaly and there should be, you know, some oversight or some investigation or a moratorium on racing. I mean, what a crazy idea that would be until we figure out what's going on in Santa Anita, right? Imagine that, you know, and it's 29 since the racing season began and 60, more than 60 since the start of 2018 it's insane to me um the governor said enough was enough supposedly the owners of the racetrack have agreed to work with the horse racing board to increase oversight at the track a horse safety review team led by state experts is supposed to evaluate each horse on whether it is at higher risk of injury before racing and my my question again i i i, I don't have a, an, an opinion on horse racing in general why wasn't this the case before why wouldn't there be experts at the track evaluating each horse to see whether it's at a higher risk of injury before racing. Doesn't that seem like just common sense to protect your investment as an owner? Well, you would think so. And that's how typically horse races are treated. Like I forget the name of the horse that won this year's Kentucky Derby, but he didn't race a couple of weeks later in the Preakness because he had like a little sneezy cough or something. Right. I mean, they like scratched him from one of the triple crown races because he said a chew. And so normally these, these horses are closely monitored is at least if they're, um, you know, <laughs> valuable horses or been winning races or, you know, are putting money in the pockets of their owners. I can't speak for, and I'm not plugged into the horse racing world. So horses that aren't winning or that, um, you know, aren't as valuable maybe in their uh, stable, don't get as much attention, sort of like people, unfortunately. I know you wanted to touch on bullshit IR. Oh, oh, yeah. So we're still going. I thought Warren was the end of the day. Yeah, no, I just wanted no, no, to no, say that. No, 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 it was that. awesome talking to Warren. But, you know, I'm going to use this to shamelessly plug our thing because Resource sure. Stock Digest is now contributing to the environment of good, factual, healthy IR. Continue, Mr. Hodge. <laughs> I've seen a lot of um, proposals and contracts and just, you know, talking with, with companies that were involved in what they're seeing out there on avenues that they can pursue to do so-called investor awareness or investment relations or whatever you want to call it to get eyeballs on their story and their... Uh, business and their executives and their stock. Um, and some of these plans I've seen are pretty crazy, like a lot of money, a uh, hundred, two hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and um well we don't have to get really into the nuts and bolts of it, but these are to do new sort of advertising campaigns that attract people to 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 see these companies, to put eyeballs on the stories. But one I saw the other day that I actually own shares of and so shame on me I guess, but um it was a cannabis company and the press release came out last night and they had been asked by the OTC exchange to comment on their recent, recent promotional activity. And so they did. And I read the press release and they named, I don't have it in front of me. I want to say it was like four or five or six different outfits that they had hired 
Um, and they had to disclose, you know, what these people were doing, paid content creation, you know, native ads, et cetera, et cetera. And I went and looked at the stock chart in the past three months or two and a half months or whatever, the stock had gone uh, from 75 cents down to 45 cents. And I'm thinking in my head, you fucks, you just hired four or five or six different investment awareness or investor relations firms and your stock went down 30 cents in the past two months. Like, it it, it didn't work. (laughs) It didn't work. And here, I'm going to read the release. In April of 2019, the company engaged three firms, Investing News Network of Vancouver, INN, for a one-year period, Global Financial Network of Toronto Global for a one-month period, and Wizard Media Group, BVBA, um, for six months. Now, full disclosure, this company has been a sponsor on Small Cap Stock Digest. We make sure... One, that we don't accept shares or options for payments. We're a pretty old-fashioned group. You shake our hand. We charge you a fee monthly for a banner on the website. We aggregate content from the world of the internet and put it on our website. And if there's an opportunity to interview management about factual material information, we provide that service as well. It doesn't seem too hard to me to be ethical in the space if you're just honest and transparent about it. The fact that the company's shares were, um, I don't know if they were halted, but obviously they, 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 they had to comment on the promotional activity at the request of the OTC markets. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know why it's 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 as hard to do this correctly as apparently it is for some groups. And and I'm not singling out these three groups. I don't know what they did or didn't do. Um but shouldn't be too hard, folks. Be honest, be transparent, stick to the rules. Um yeah, we'll leave it there. Well, um the <laughs> like you say, it's it's not too complicated, but here's the one sentence in here. Um and it, 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 it's way, way down in the press release, and it's talking about the shares that one of the IR firms had. And it says um, CFC, which I think is Contact Financial, has confirmed that it has purchased 98,500 shares and sold 103,500 shares through the facilities of the CSE in the, in the last 90 days. So, um, you know, they word it in such a way that you got to actually think to figure out what that sentence means. But that sentence means that the the IR firm that the company hired had sold more fucking shares than they bought. That should not be happening. And you know what? Right. <laughs> that should not be happening. I'm going to be Captain Obvious here. And then the, and then the second thing I'm going to say is chemistry is actually a pretty interesting company. Like there, there's a reason that they are a sponsor on small cap stock digest for us. We like the company. We're biased. We think, um, you know, that they're going to do good things and they have done very good things in the cannabis space. So I encourage everybody to go and take a look at the company. I'm wearing my IR hat sponsor hat now. Right. But the, the, the company is run by good people. Um, as far as we can tell up until now, they haven't had any issues and they've actually executed their business model pretty well. So it'll be interesting to me um, to see what else develops. I believe that the non-executive chairman um, announced his resignation, I think just hours ago. So interesting to see where this goes, but just do the right thing, people. Do it the right way. Be honest, be transparent. Um, there's nothing wrong with companies wanting to tell their story and there's nothing wrong for accepting payment to tell that story. If you believe in it, just do it the right way. Unfortunately, Gerardo, you don't make as much money as fast the right way. It, it involves patience and ethics and things that some people don't have. Ah, but you sleep so much better and you last in this business so much longer. Oh, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> I think that's our cue, everybody. We've gone on for about an hour and 15 minutes. It was awesome having Warren on. Nick, it's always great to get your take. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Or are you pretty, you're you going to be pretty good for this Father's Day weekend. You ready to go? No, I'm pretty good. As you know, you, you and I will be together next week. I fly out Sunday, so I'll technically miss Father's Day. But we'll have a good Saturday tomorrow. So I'll see you soon. We'll see you soon, sir. Bitcoin's at 8600 now. This has been episode 23 of Bizarro World. Be nice to each other. Have a great week, everybody. See ya.